they'll be like the Bank of Japan, just own, you know, own the treasury market. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? We're going to end up like Japan. That's the best case scenario. We either could end up like Zimbabwe or Japan. Yeah. Uh, Zimbabwe, you know, hyperinflation or Japan, a zombie nation with no GDP growth for like decades. Zero. Yeah. Now you say, well, what's the problem with that, Mr. Pento? Michael Pento, how are you? Andy Millet, I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing really good. Uh, Naples, Florida, is that correct? That's where I am. I, that's where I am currently. Currently, beautiful, beautiful town. That is probably our favorite, one of our, uh, my wife's and I, top five favorite places in the U.S. Um, probably our favorite spot in Florida. It's absolutely gorgeous. So, Definitely agree with you. <laughs> so uh we had a rate cut yesterday and some a lot of people are saying it was a uh panic if you would or even um election induced because of the election coming up what are two questions what are your macro thoughts Thirty thousand foot view have they've changed at all in the last um since i've had you on that was about six months ago and um what are your thoughts on the rate cut? And what does that mean for assets, asset prices specifically for gold, silver, precious metals, commodities, that sort of thing? Well, I hope you give me like a three days to answer it. <laughs> well, it goes as long as you like. Right, let, let's just start. Let's just rewind it. Uh, so first of all, I'm disgusted. I'm actually disgusted that Powell cut rates. Actually, he shouldn't have cut rates at all, Andy. I, I think the middle class has been destroyed. Actually, the bottom four quintiles of Americans are really had their purchasing power wiped out. It's the level of prices that Powell never talks about. And you have some, I try, I can't, I can't really be mean to people. I'm not, I'm, Mark Vandy is the person that I won't use pejorative names. I won't call him any kind of pejorative names, but he, 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 he you know, he's like, well, you know, inflation is a genie back in the bottle. We don't have any problems with inflation. You know, I was talking to my niece the other day, and she says she buys, like, ramen noodles. Everybody has their anecdotal story about going to the store and having a problem buying, you know, macaroni and cheese or whatever. And it's like, it's, but inflation is back in the bottle. That's a bit, hey, hey, asshole. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't, don't be can, sorry. Don't be sorry. You can edit that out. Yeah. People can't afford to buy a freaking house. Okay, they can't sure. afford insurance. They can't sure. afford to buy a car. They can't afford to pay taxes. This is the average middle class person has been wiped out. And the fact that inflation is growing at two and a half percent, which is higher than two, and core is growing at 3.2% year over year. This is not my inflation data that I came up at. This is the CPI, Bureau of Labor Statistics, okay? The Bar Department of Labor. They, they say inflation is growing 3.2% on the core rate year over year. Not me. It's growing above the Fed's um, target. I could say asinine target level. We should target should be zero. Actually, there shouldn't be any Fed. But but we have a Fed. Their target should be stable prices. It's not. It's two percent, but not really two. It's now three point two, or two and a half. And it's from a level where home prices are up fifty percent in the last four years, and they can't afford a house. But 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 it, it's just an anecdotal story that my niece can't buy ramen noodles in the store. Okay, so let's see. Fed cut rates, GD, the Atlanta Fed GDP, which I don't, I think their model's a little skewy, uh, a little screwy lately, but it, and they say it's 3% Q3 GDP growth at a seasonally adjusted annualized rate. The unemployment rate is 4.2%. The average long term unemployment, unemployment is 5.7%. Okay. Uh, credit spreads are very tight. Um, financial conditions are very easy. So why did Powell find the need to go 50 basis points? It wasn't because the stock prices are at record high. Home prices are at a record high. Unemployment rate is historically very low. GDP growth is at um, four, uh, 3%, according to the Atlanta Fed. And what else I in, my, in my, my brain here? Uh, so, and I also mentioned CPI being way above trend. So, Oh, I think I know the reason. I think I found out the reason why. I think I know the reason, Andy. I know the reason why the Fed cut rates by 50 basis points in an emergency move, the first cut in four years. Tell me. Because the deficit is $2 trillion. And the interest on the deficit is a trillion dollars plus. 
And maybe the Fed says, hmm, we have like an adjustable rate mortgage on our debt and we have a lot of short-term debt. And maybe I need to help out my buddy, Janet Yellen, and take interest rates down a little bit so we don't have to pay so much interest on our insolvent condition, which is known as the treasury. How's that for a start off of answer your first question? Okay, because if you're in the middle class, you should be really pissed off. This guy doesn't care about you. Cares about Wall Street, that we can't even have a down tick in the economy. What we need, Andy, what we need is a recession. We do have to have some pain associated with that because we need deflation. We need asset prices to fall down to a level that can be supported by a free market and not this endless cycle and endless iterations of bubble after bubble after bubble. Yeah. Well, I would totally agree with everything you said. Uh, my anecdotal story is I was literally buying a hamburger the other day and it was $17 to buy a hamburger. Where'd you, where, where'd you go? It was at, just at a local place here in Tucker, just a local store trying to eat local. And it was $17 to buy a hamburger. And I was just trying to think back, back to myself, like when, when it was $10, this <laughs> a good old day. So it was $10, you know? Um, and another thing too, is I think deflation gets a really bad rap. I mean, deflation's really good, especially for me in the middle class, if you would, I mean, I want deflation, what, right? What is wrong? What in the hell is wrong with having the, the money you work so hard for, the purchasing power of that dollar to go a little further? You know, it's, it's deflation, or at least disinflation, quiescent inflation. We can get into the nuances of definitions. But deflation, or at least stasis in inflation, is an ancillary conflict of productivity. Uh, I can produce more goods with the same amount of labor. Uh, I can lower my prices. And still make a lot of money. Right. That's the natural, that's the natural, like, look, look, look at the Model T Ford, you know? You, you, you can, productivity, you can make more of them, can lower the price, sell more, everybody's happy. It's not the end of the world that prices go down a little bit, but it is the end of the world if you're a bank and you're leveraged to the hilt on yeah. more back securities, <laughs> yeah. and commercial CMBS and MBS, and you're like, oh my God. If we have deflation in housing, I'm screwed. And that's, but, but, but by the way, that's who the central bank really works for. They work for banks. Yeah. Banks, not you. They don't really care. They pretend to care about you, but they, what they really care about is endless bubbles. And that's what we have here. Endless bubbles. But you know what? I got to say, I got so much to say. So, you know, the last, let's look at the last three times the Fed cut interest rates by 50 basis points. So I'll go back to the first one. So the first of the three would be in the year 2001. And that was the summer of 2001, the Fed cut by 50 basis points. Uh, and two years later, the stock prices were down by 50%, S&P 500. Okay, let's fast forward to 2007, summer of 2007. Fed, the Fed under Ben Bernanke, oh, we got a problem here. We got some problem. It's contained. It's, everything's great. But we have a little problem in some, you know, Bear Stearns leveraged uh, mortgage uh, um, hedge funds. Let's cut rates by 50 basis points. Well, two years later, the S&P was down 50%. And, and then you also have the last one, which is 2020, when the Fed cut rates in February, dropped them to zero very quickly. And we still lost 30% plus in a matter of weeks in the S&P 500. So the fact that the Fed is cutting rates by 50 basis points doesn't exactly engender a prosperity. It doesn't ensure anything. You know, we still have a positive, real Fed funds rate. The yield curve just normalized after being inverted for the longest period of time in history. Mm -hmm. And for the, one of the deepest inversions in history, uh, we still have the middle class has been wiped out by inflation. Um, so. Just because the Fed cut rates by 50 basis points and it's going to do another 50 um, by the end of this year doesn't guarantee anything. It doesn't guarantee anything. It certainly doesn't guarantee, it certainly doesn't, you know what it certainly doesn't guarantee? Any, it certainly doesn't guarantee that we're going to have a 15% earnings per share growth 
which is, you know, penned in for 2025. That's not, and that's not going to happen. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's game this out then, I guess, when we're looking at the, um, the dot plot and the trajectory, what does this all mean if the Fed's going to cut again? And again, it doesn't guarantee the asset prices or the stock market will go up again. It doesn't guarantee that housing will, uh, will go up and it doesn't guarantee that we're going to have a soft lamb in which I, which I never thought well, we would have. But what does this mean? Because this has implications, I mean, throughout the currency markets, throughout the global, uh, just because I just saw, what was I reading today that Japan, no, it wasn't Japan, it was the Bank of England, I think was holding steady on their rates. I mean, it's, it seems like we're going into a currency war right here. Well, Bank of Japan did also, you're right, UADA. I mean, you know, they, after being like, you know, for a very, very long time at negative rates, he raised rates to zero and then he, he raised them to one quarter of 1%. And that was enough to like, you know, send a, send the shockwaves throughout the entire financial markets because it was a reversal of the end carry trade. So, yeah. um, yeah, I, you know, I just want to emphasize the point that just because the Fed cut interest rates, you know, you still have QT going on, quantitative yeah. tightening. So supposedly the Fed's balance sheet is supposed to be shrinking. Now, the Fed doesn't just create, an, uh, uh, you know, they, they don't have um, authority to just say, the Fed funds rate is going to be blank. And, and then it just magically appears there. They do it through, you know, intervention in the bond, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, repo market. So uh, they're either buying or selling bonds to get the money supplied to a point where the Fed funds target level is hit. So now that they're lowering interest rates, they're supposedly printing money out of thin air, buying bonds and flooding the repo market with, with cash, which is already flooded with cash. But yeah. then I guess they're draining reserves because they're draining their balance sheet. I guess they're selling long-term bonds or mortgage-backed securities. I don't know what they're, I don't know how they're going to get, how are they going to get the balance sheet to decline when they're also trying to get the money supply to increase so the Fed funds rate goes down? They're not. I, I, I mean, they, you know what, Andy, did, did anybody ask that question? Because I did listen to the press conference. It's stupid. The, the, I don't know. What, did any, why did anybody say, I would, I would have, they'll never invite me because I, I mean, they, they, for obvious reasons or anybody who ever listened to me. But I would ask the question, Mr. Powell, how are you going to get the, the balance sheet to shrink while you're also printing money to get the Fed funds market reliquified so you can bring interest rates lower? How's that going to happen? What are you going to do? Did he, did he, how would he answer that? Yeah. No, I don't think he, you wouldn't answer it. <laughs> he couldn't answer it. I, I don't, I, I, why are you asking me questions about printing money? We're, we never talk about the fact that we put, we printed, we printed $9 trillion, you know, to get the balance sheet to $9 trillion. And since 19, since 1913, we counterfeited $9 trillion. Four and a half trillion of it was countered just in the past few years. Yeah. I mean, what, you know, come on. It's just, it's ridiculous. So. Let's go back to the, what does this mean though? And obviously this would be very bullish for commodities. Tell me what, or you think commodities. Yeah. Here's the thing. So what we have, what I predicted and what I was accurate about is that I said that the second derivative, the rate of change or the rate of change of inflation and growth would be slowing. And, and that's the reason why we're doing very well here at uh, with our allocation at Pento Port, because inflation has come down. It's called disinflation from 9% to you know, depend how to two and a half, three point two, something like that. So that's that's one set of circumstances that leads you to want to overweight bonds, and it's particularly in my in my portfolio, short term short duration short -term bonds. Yeah, short term treasuries in the portfolio. I just made a lot of money on that trade. Yeah, that was a good trade. We also have bond and bond proxies. So we have bond proxies like you know uh, utilities have done very well. So that was correct because the economic growth is slowing. I mean, let's let's not ignore the fact that the unemployment rate is rising. It's still very low, yeah. but it is rising. So the rate of change is showing that there's consumers in trouble, and there's still delinquencies and defaults are rising pretty sharply too. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think, and I don't think fifty basis points. First of all, the fifty basis point rate cut, Andy, was completely priced into the bond market. Mm -hmm. so you, have, you have a ten-year Treasury at three point seven percent. So guess what happened when the? This is another thing that bothers me. So they had one of these, this guy Rosengren on. Well, the Fed just cut 50 basis points. And that's going to be wonderful for the housing market because the mortgages are going to fall. Well, 
if you were bothered to care about being honest, you would have said interest rates are soaring by 14 basis points since you cut on the 10 year note as of yet, as of, as of this morning. Um, they were up 14 basis points since you cut the short term rate by 50 basis points. Because be, you know what? Because short term rates are controlled by the Fed because the money markets are compete with each other. But long term rates are concerned, concerned about inflation and credit quality of the government. Yeah. And both those things stink. Yeah. And at 3.7%, there isn't any room for the 10 year note to go lower in yield and higher in price outside of a recession. So if you're going to keep talking about uh, soft landings and puppy dogs and rainbows and rosebuds, and you're talking about the fact that inflation is, you know, not inflation is not going any lower. It's going to go higher. If that's what you think you've, you've, you know, you've, you, you now want to try to get inflation to go a little higher, right? That's what he's trying to do. You don't want any more damage to the labor market. No more damage. So, so, if, so if the, if the country is, is virtually insolvent and you are no longer fighting disinflation, you're now going to try to reflate the economy. Why in the world would anybody buy a 10 year note at 3.7%? There's no reason to. Zero. There's Unless no outside of a recession a, and, a, and a bad one, why would you buy? I mean, it, let's just see 2% inflation plus 2% trend growth is four. Yeah. And four is higher than 3.7. Right? So why would I do that? Yeah. I wouldn't. That makes so sense. Absolutely no sense. Um, is there value still, though, in the short-term bond trade, do you think? Yes. I think, that, I think there is because the Fed has said that they're going to take the rates down eventually by the end of, I think, 2005, 2006, 2025, 2026, excuse me. 2.9% is where they want to end up. Well, and we're at 36 So the, the, the Fed is, is, wants to take that short-term rate down. So that's where I'm invested. That's, you know, it's very yes. safe. Treasuries will never default explicitly. They are implicit, <laughs> yeah, right. implicit, implicit, implicitly defaulting all of the time through inflation. Yeah. But explicitly, like, oh, the government is, oh, the government's great. They'll just print all the money they have. They'll be like the Bank of Japan, just own, you know, own the treasury market. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? We're going to end up like Japan. That's the best case scenario. We either could end up like Zimbabwe or Japan. Yeah. Uh, Zimbabwe, you know, hyperinflation or Japan, a zombie nation with no GDP growth for like decades. Zero. Yeah. Now you say, well, what's the problem with that, Mr. Pento? Well, if there's zero GDP growth, that's going to mean there's zero earnings growth. And zero, zero earnings growth means that asset prices are absolutely ridiculously overpriced. They're trading... It's 21 times forward earnings and the forward earnings aren't going to be, aren't going to be 15 percent no, growth. It's going to be zero if we're Japan. Right. Right. So we have a problem. We have, we, you know, I don't know if it's going to be, I, I don't know if it's going to be Zimbabwe or Argentina or Hungary. I don't know if, 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 if it will be that or Japan, but either one of those conditions are really, really bad. And that's where we're headed. Unfortunately, yeah. in my opinion. Okay, so what does an investor do then? I mean, obviously, like you, and I would agree with that trade, and it's worked really well for you, is to buy the short-term bonds. Um, and then where else do they part? Well, gold. I mean, I've been, buying, I've, been, I've been long gold for a very long time, physical gold. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's outperformed the S&P 500 for like, you know, a quarter of a century. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I mean, you know what? You know, it's funny. Yeah. You know, I, how come there's I no- thought we were nuts 20 years ago. there's no show, like, crypto world or CNBC and Bloomberg. You always have these crypto hours and crypto. And Donald Trump is the crypto president. I mean, why, do, why don't we have, I have a question for you. Why don't we have a show on how real, honest money, gold, it's in the, by the way, it's in the constitution. The constitution. Why don't we have a show on how great gold is and how we should really just go back to a gold standard and kick all these bums out of DC, do they, yeah. who, think, yeah. who think they're omniscient yeah. and that they could like, is there like an egg policy committee? What's how many eggs should we produce? And how many, how many, what's the cost of eggs? Well, no one knows. Nobody knows because it's just, in, it's incalculable. Not even AI can figure it out. <laughs> Why do we have 12, 12 individuals setting the price of money? Now, Powell, 
here's here, listen. If I was the head of the Federal Reserve, you can make fun of me too, Andy. I'm a moron. I don't know what the cost of money should be. I really don't. I think I know better than he does. But so Powell's Powell's saying that in, inflation was transitory after he created this massive inflation with, by by printing counterfeiting four and a half trillion dollars of credit, Fed credit. And then he says it's transitory. Then it turns out to be not transitory. Then he panics and starts 75 basis point panic rate cut rate hikes, excuse me. And then he says, yeah, you know what? Maybe it's time to start cutting rates. And instead of doing it the way a normal cycle would be, is starting to cut interest rates by 25 basis point increments, he has an emergency move by 50 by tacitly admitting that he has no clue no clue what he's doing. It was completely. And I don't blame him. Nobody has any clue. Right. Right. And it's completely insane. <laughs> but okay. So short term debt, I would 100% agree. Gold, 100% agree. And, and I've been following you for a long time. Um, and I, I'm a gold. I would put a lot of money in gold. And that's what a lot of people don't realize is that gold has outperformed the S&P for 25 years. We're going on 25 years right now. And it's still never talked about. Yeah, and, okay. and, and can I just say, uh, add? Please. Gold has been outperforming the S&P, even with its AI crap in it, at a much better sharp ratio. In other words, without the volatility. Yep. So its volatility adjusted returns are way better than the S&P 500. And nobody talks about it as an asset class. Yep. They want to own Bitcoin, even though there's an unlimited number of blockchains that can be created. I think Trump wants, and I, listen, and I'm not bad mouthing Trump. I, I am not. I'm a libertarian, so I'm more on his side than I am. I'm a, but I'll be honest with you. Uh, should he shouldn't he be the president of gold and hard money rather than the president of crypto? I mean, how could? Here's the thing. It, it, there's talk about a Fed coin or an international coin or, you know, an international monetary fund coin or a Chinese coin. That's a digital, a digital currency, central bank digital currency is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. um, well, doesn't it, any, it, it like dawn on people that there's an unlimited number of blockchains that can be created that where this coin can ride along and this, you know, this, this ledger, this digital ledger that, you know, is in, it, it's, it's, it's um, supposedly it's something that is um, private. You know, it's decentralized. It's immutable. Well, then, if it's if such a private decentralized thing, why is Wall Street involved in it? And once Wall Street gets involved, it's a great question. You know, like say, you know, I I own Bitcoin, and here's my you know KYC, and know your customer, and anti money laundering. They all know my name. They all know my address. They all know it, and I, and, I, and it drives the price to the moon, sixty three thousand dollars a unit. But without Wall Street involved, it, the price would be a lot less. Yep. So, so this thing that only gets value because it's decentralized is only valuable because it's centralized. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, it's funny, an anecdotal story on this. You mentioned the sharp ratio on gold and relative to the S&P. I wrote, I just put out a newsletter. Um, this was in 2007. I made a portfolio and the guy did it. He was a client, very one of the wealthiest families in Georgia. And we put a half, this was in 2007, right before everything blowing up, we put half of the money in gold, the other in short-term debt. And then we, we stress tested, tested it, and it had a more stable return. We didn't know if it'd be better, but it was going to be a more stable return than a, than a typical allocation to bonds and stocks. And most people didn't get that. And he was shocked. And here we are, 20 years later. <laughs> Risk-adjusted returns. Yeah. And just wait old returns. Yep. The gold. Gold. So, yep. Still, nobody really... I mean, I, where is the special? The special hour. I want a whole hour devoted to the importance of gold and tying money to gold. Yeah. What, you know... There's a reason for can I just just brief and briefly truncate this as much as possible. So the mine supply of gold is about one or two percent a year. It's commensurate with trend GDP growth, which is labor force growth plus productivity. This way, the 
the money supply grows commensurate with the potential GDP growth, and you don't get any inflation. You yeah. don't get massive spikes in interest rates. You don't have you have a stable dollar, you know, stable interest rates, stable inflation. You have stability. You know, yeah, but it's all you know what it is, Andy. It's all about power. Where's the power? It's Where's exactly, the power in that, Andy? There's no exactly, power. Exactly. I want to have great power. Look at Jackson Hole. There's a moose over yeah. there. Look at me. I'm the power. Look at me. <laughs> Side wearing it, you know. Come on, yeah. You should be humble and admit you have no damn clue what you're doing. You yeah. date if you're date Powell. If you're data dependent, and the and you have just had this GDP growth, the projections going higher, and you have unemployment rate quiescent, and credit markets quiescent, and asset bubbles galore, um, and the CPI is still way above your trend. Why did why would you do an emergency move? I know we talked about this already, but it just I, it just bothers me to no end. And that there's not enough. See, I don't know what your audience is. I think it's pretty pretty significant, substantial. But there should be a conversation where millions of people can hear this talk. This is just, and I'm not. In, I mean, I've been in business 33 years. I'm not somebody who you know crawled out of my you know my mother's basement or something. You know, I've been doing. I've been managing money for a very long time. I I was on CNBC, Bloomberg. Fox. I was predicting the housing crisis in the middle of the 2000s. I remember all of that to say no. And they kicked me off. They kicked me off. <laughs> they want me on. What, why don't we have an honest discussion? Because people would like to know mm -hmm. what's going on. Maybe they would like to know what's going on with their money. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't care. They don't care. As long as the S&P goes up, they don't care. Well, I have, like I said, I have news for you. Guess what? The last, the last three times the Fed cut interest rate, it was not a panacea. Yep. Yep. Okay. So let's, let me talk about, ask you a few more questions about other assets. Do you like other commodity assets, if you would? And that means from like the miners um, or uh, do you like energy? Um, what other things do you like from here? Assuming again, you're going off and this is tricky because we're going off of two different scenarios. We're going off of Zimbabwe. Yes. <laughs> yes. Going off of Japan. Yeah. So, so I have a five, sector palette where I could invest between deflation and stagflation or hyperinflation and tractable inflation. You know, so, so, you have, so you have you have stasis and then on the left side you have disinflation, which is the rate of change is slowing. It means you went from nine to three. You still have inflation, but it's the rate of change is slowing. Then you have deflation, which is actually prices falling. On the other on the right side you have reflation and then you have intractable inflation. And I look at those five different things, those five different sectors of inflation in the context of the economy is the is economic growth falling or is it accelerating in a, in a rate of change basis on the second derivative basis? So that's how I manage money. So now that now that the Fed cut interest rates by fifty basis points, which is sort of like a sell the news kind of kind of deal to me, I think judging by the fact that banks are still very tight in their lending standards, the fact that the yield curve just uninverted. The fact that the Fed funds rate is still in positive terms, very, very, in real terms, very positive. Um, the fact that they're still supposedly doing QT, uh, we'll see. The odds are that we are still heading for problems, which is disinflation going to deflation and a recession. If that's the case, then I would, I would avoid all commodities except the monetary metal gold. And that's where I'm leaning. But... Again, this is something, like you said, it's very tricky. You have to monitor the situation when daily. I, I have highly stochastic parts of my model that look at the rate of change of the CRB index. Mm -hmm. um, I look at the Baltic dry index. I look at the money supply growth. I look at highly, very highly stochastic uh, measures, credit spreads to let me know if I'm correct or incorrect mm -hmm. in my assumption of disinflation morphing to deflation or at least staying in a disinflation. So if I'm wrong, and, and if I could be wrong, I'm not, unlike Jerome Powell, I'm not God, I'm not omniscient, I, I could be wrong. And this could be an exception to the rule where, hey, this is the first time in history where the, the, the inverted yield curve didn't lead to a recession and the, and the first time in a very long time that a real positive Fed funds rate didn't lead to a crash. And we're ignoring the massive asset bubbles we have in credit and in housing and in, uh, in, in equities. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. And if that's the case, then I have to add. I have to add some commodities. I would probably start with energy. But right now, I'm still. I'm sticking where I am. 
because it's worked. Yeah. And, and until the model tells me that we're having a, in a rate of change basis, an acceleration of inflation. And inflation, by the way, is no accident. It doesn't come about, it's not an, an osmosis event. It comes about from too much money printing, too much money creation. Well, like I just said, the banks are still tightening lending standards and people just can't afford a house. So, I mean, it, banks are constrained. They have also capital constraints. They're, 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 uh, um, Dodd-Frank rule. The, um, there's congressional uh, increases in their capital that they have to hold. So I'm, I'm saying that I have, you have to pay attention. The 60-40 portfolio does not work. It hasn't worked for a very long time. Pay attention to the metrics that I look at in order to determine what's happening with the uh, second inflation and growth. Yeah, that is a great answer. Um, and I think we'll end on that. Um, Michael, um, how can people um, reach you and find out more about you if they want to uh, do business with you? So it's pentoport.com is the website. I have a podcast that I put out every Wednesday called the Midweek Reality Check. And I give you some, you know, re a real take on the salient data points that you need to be paying attention to. Um, and if you have $100,000 or more and you're a U.S. citizen, I'll manage your money directly in the inflation, deflation, and economic cycle portfolio. And that's the best thing you can, you can have. I, I think it's the, best, it's, the best, it's the best way you have of making money in all situations. And because let me tell you something, if you look at the, the diff, the, there's a vastly different investment strategy that needs to be deployed if we're Japan, as opposed to Zimbabwe. It's vastly different, but we're headed for one of those outcomes. And I'm leaning towards the inflation, the stagflationary, like intense stagflation like we never before seen. So if that's the case, you, I would sell my treasuries and I would overlay, overweight base metals and energy. Mm -hmm. um, I would short the bond market. Right. I'd be long yield curve st steepeners mm -hmm. like I am now. I am, I'm, long a, I'm long a yield curve steepener. So, um, but both those, both, both those ac outcomes are not ideal for the average American consumer. I mean, a deflation, a depression, I don't think, it, but by the way, I, if we do get that deflationary recession, it's not gonna last long. Cause yeah. I, I, I mean, owl, the market has already been inculcated through various iterations of Fed cycles. And Powell even said it himself. I mean, we don't think we're going back to zero, but if the, if the credit markets freeze, and that's what my model predicts best, <laughs> he's going back to zero. Now, let me, and I'm close with this. What do you, what do you think, who is going to be fooled now? If they go back to zero, ZERP and QE again, do you think inflation is going to go to 9% and stop? No way. No way. It's going well into the double digits. So you need to have a different strategy than 60, 40 and call your broker and they say, oh, don't worry, the market always comes back. Well, yeah, unless it was 1929, it took 25 years for the market to come back. And if, you're in, and if you're in China, you're still waiting since 2007. Yeah. And if you're in Japan, you've been waiting since 1989. 40 years, yep, yep. No, over 40 years. Um, so all of our listeners and viewers, uh, just so you know, I've been following Michael. Michael has been over 20 years or at least 20 years. Um, Michael is probably one of, if not the person I'm most aligned with as far as portfolio management. And I've managed a lot of money back in the day. And you really, especially in today's times, you really have to be just aware. And the old construction just doesn't really work anymore. You really have to be aware. So kudos to you, Michael. I want to thank you Michael. so much for coming on. Um, it, it was an absolute pleasure. And it, I just learn a lot every time you talk. So thank you so much for that. Andy, it was my pleasure. Thank you for it. Your time and your great questions. I look forward to doing it again sometime in the near future. We absolutely will. All right. Thank you. Thank you.